Hello, my name is Janet Iwasa, and I'm an animator at Harvard Medical School. I'll be talking to you today about some of the reasons I first got interested in animation and the ways I think animation can really give back to the research community. So this animation of Kinesin was really one of the first things that I saw that really got me interested in animation. I remember I was about a first or second year graduate student in Dyke Mullen's lab studying the actin cytoskeleton at the time. And I remember looking at this animation and thinking, why aren't we all doing this? Why are we relying on these oversimplified static illustrations um, when we can really be doing something like this that shows dynamics and a lot of things way more accurately than we currently are? Um, so within a year, I started taking animation courses at a local university and also started doing animations of some of the processes that my lab was studying. So all of my animations are really a really close collaboration between myself and the people who are doing the research. Um, and there's a lot of real back and forth um, that goes on in the process of creating these animations where we go through many, many iterations and change things like color and dynamics, and in this case, the number of filaments, how fast they should be depolymerizing and polymerizing. Um, and so it's really, it's really this great collaborative process. Animations, it's really a pretty steep learning curve to learning animations. And um, it was also, each animation really took me quite a long time, especially at the beginning. But I found that I really loved the process. I loved sitting down with my lab mates and trying to figure out um, what these kind of processes should look like visually. And I also found that it could really give back to the research quite a bit. So when you're creating an animation, you're really grappling with a lot of issues that don't necessarily come up by any other means. For example, you have to think about not only stoichiometry, but also dynamics and crowding, things that may not come up if you're really creating these very simple illustrations. Um, so towards the end of graduate school, I became interested in trying to look for opportunities that I might be able to do animation as a postdoctoral fellow. And I was really lucky to find a, an opportunity that was offered by the National Science Foundation called the Discovery Corps. Um, and so under the, as a Discovery Corps fellow, I worked for two years with Jack Shostak at Mass General Hospital and the Museum of Science in Boston to create a multimedia exhibit on the origins of life. And this used a number of animations that explored ideas around the um, RNA world hypothesis, as well as some ideas of what the early Earth might have looked like. So many of these animations really served a dual purpose. First, they were incorporated into a multimedia exhibit that included um, a website as well as an, a kiosk on the museum floor, and it's currently there right now, as well as um, a number of um, live, live presentations that I gave at the Museum of Science. Um, and they were also used by researchers in the lab to talk about their science to other researchers. And what we found was that just by altering the context as well as the narration for these animations, you could really use the same animations for two different audiences. I also grew quite a lot as an animator during this time. Um, so I was really lucky to be able to take kind of a crash course in animation in Hollywood for the summer d before my, my postdoc started. And this really allowed me to kind of hit the ground running. Um, and I also found that there are a lot of tricks you have to use in animation to create molecular animations. Um, so a lot of the animation packages that we use today are really more for animating things like Buzz Lightyear rather than molecules like actin. Um, so for example, for this animation, I use a cloth simulation to try to create um, a simulation of, of RNA folding. So what I also found was that animation could be a great handle for that the public could use to try to grasp and understand complex molecular ideas. Um, so animation can really eliminate the need for jargon in many cases and is also quite approachable. Um, and so for, that, for these kinds of reasons, I think animation can really be a great, uh, a great tool to try to make a positive impact on science education as well as the public uh, perception of science and ultimately and hopefully uh, science policy. After uh, my postdoc, I started working at Harvard Medical School in the cell biology department. One of the things that I'm really interested in understanding is how animation can be used by researchers to better explore and communicate um, their, their kind of molecular hypotheses. Um, and so this is an example of these kind, this kind of project. Um, this is an animation of clathrin-mediated endocytosis that I worked on with Tom Kirkhausen. And what I found was that animations can really synthesize a great deal of information, including um, about, you can include molecular structures from crystal structures and EM um, sources, as well as you can include dynamics um, from light microscopy data, as well as uh, how protein-protein interactions that are derived from genetics and biochemical experiments. 
And another thing to note is that these kind of animations are really kind of a visualization of a hypothesis. So they may not, everything in the animation may not be um, completely supported by experimental evidence, while other things may be. And I think that's the same for any kind of hypothesis. I also found that animations can really be um, quite interesting for researchers. So the process of creating an animation really makes you, as I mentioned before, grapple with different issues that may not come up when you're making other types of illustrations. Um, so it's really kind of putting together a three-dimensional or four-dimensional puzzle. And by manipulating these different pieces, you can really come up with a lot of different ideas that uh, may not come up otherwise. And I think for that reason, um, these kind of animation and animation tools may be able to really give back to research in the research process. So this final project that I'd like to talk to you about is a project that I'm working on with Samrek Peterson at Harvard Medical School. Her lab is interested in understanding uh, the motor protein dynein and how it walks along microtubules. So as you might imagine, this is a really three-dimensional and dynamic process. Um, and so using a 2D illustration such as this one really can be of limited utility um, when thinking about these kinds of problems. And so what we did together was to create a three-dimensional uh, model of dynein that you, the, the lab could manipulate and move around and really kind of Used to, they could use it to explore the molecule in ways that they really weren't able to before. And so really the, the goal of this project wasn't to create a really finished and polished animation, but really to create a new tool that the lab could use to better study this process. And using these kind of models, you can really start to visualize uh, the walk cycle of dynein, for example. Um, and each person in the lab, you can imagine, might have a different idea of how this happens. And you can also start to try to predict what might happen if, for example, you mutated the protein or you put it into different conditions. And you can compare those things side by side and, and potentially start designing experiments around these kinds of ideas. Um, and finally, I wanted to leave, uh, leave you with a list of resources that I hope might be useful for those of you interested in learning more about animation. Uh, the first is my website at Harvard Medical School, where you can download many of the animations that I showed you today, as well as um, new, new animations and new projects as they come up. Um, the second link here is called MolecularMovies.org, which is a really excellent resource. It, um, it has a gallery of animations that you can download, a number of tutorials specific for molecular animation. Um, and there are also, in the past few years, there's been a number of efforts to try to create new toolkits within animation programs that can be used by researchers to more easily um, upload and manipulate molecules. Um, and so this includes um, Molecular Maya, which is available on MolecularMovies.org, and this is for the program Maya. There's also EPMB, um, which is available for Cinema 4D, Maya, and Blender. And there's also BioBlender, which is a toolkit for Blender. Um, so I really encourage you to take a look at some of these websites if you're interested in learning more, and also feel free to contact me as well. Um, and also keep in mind that many of the uh, software that's out there, you can download an educational version and start exploring these sort of animation tools for, for pretty much no cost. Um, and so that's also something that you might consider doing as well. Thank you.